put people online so I think we have a quorum. So thank you, thank you everyone for uh, joining us uh, today. Um, and uh, it, it's really a, a pleasure to see uh, that, you know, there's a, so much interest around the topic that we are going to discuss today. So I'm personally very excited about the webinar uh, because we have an interesting and uh, a challenging topic that we want to unpack. We have amazing speakers and we have a great audience. Um, and uh, I'm particularly glad to see that we have uh, uh, many people working in, uh, uh, in field offices and that's really, uh, that's really exciting. Um, so um, before actually uh, getting started with the presentations, I would like to say a couple of words on, uh, uh, on the Center for Humanitarian Data. And I don't know if you can, yeah, perfect. Thank you, Karim. So you should be able to see a couple of slides. So most of you uh, joining today are probably familiar with the Center for Humanitarian Data, but I just wanted to remind uh, everyone uh, about the, the goal of the Center and the, the overall you know, objective of, uh, of our work. That is to increase the use and the impact of data in humanitarian response. And we're doing this in, uh, uh, in different ways. And here you see uh, all the different focus areas uh, of, uh, of the center. So engaging on services around data, most of you are probably familiar with the, uh, the humanitarian data exchange, HDX, um, around data policies and data responsibility, data literacy, so providing trainings to upskill uh, humanitarians. And that's uh, and then there's the, the, the latest work stream that we launched a little more than one year ago around predictive analytics. That is really around, you know, supporting humanitarian organizations, making uh, better use of forward looking analysis and models. And when we launched the predictive analytics uh, work stream, one of the key objectives was really to fill the gap between uh, modelers and technical experts and humanitarians. And that's really one of the key objectives of the webinar uh, today. So today we're also launching a, a series of webinars where we would like with you uh, explore the use of specific models and specific methodologies in uh, the humanitarian sector. And we decided to start with uh, this specific topic around, uh, you know, uh, uh, complex systems modeling. First of all, because of the scale of uh, humanitarian needs. In the latest uh, humanitarian needs overview, uh, we uh, estimated that 235 million people are in need of assistance, but also because of the complexity of the humanitarian crisis requires us to adapt the tools that we use to, to understand needs, to make projections and to develop scenarios. And that's exactly what we'll be exploring today. So how can we use complex system modeling in uh, our understanding of humanitarian crisis? So I'm very, very excited uh, to welcome all the speakers uh, that will give us an overview of the work that they're doing, the methodologies that could be uh, used, but that they will, will also provide practical examples. And I already want to thank uh, them all for uh, joining today. And thank you all for uh, uh, connecting uh, today. Just a couple of um, uh, practical uh, inf uh, piece of information. So. Um, in the bottom right, you should see uh, a chat if you want to discuss with participants. And then you also see, you, you can also find, uh, I don't know if it's visible directly or you should click on the three dots in the bottom right of the screen, you see a QA and a uh, panel. That's where you can post questions. And so we'll try to um, you know, address them all. You can also vote for questions, so we will definitely start with the with the questions that have 
uh, more uh, votes. There will be some time for discussion towards the end, but we'll also try if time allows to uh, have questions right after the presentation. So the event is 60 minutes long, so we wanted to keep it short and sweet. And so uh, let's get started um, immediately. So first of all, I would like to um, invite uh, Birki Kopanski. Uh, to kick off the discussion. So Birgit is a professor of system dynamics at the University of Bergen in Norway. And I'm really excited to have uh, Birgit here today because she has a great experience in developing models to support policy making in, uh, uh, in different uh, developing countries. So uh, Birgit will give us an introduction uh, to the main methodology that is used to to, to model and to understand complex systems, and will also provide concrete examples of how models have been used in the past and the insights uh, that these models can provide. So without further ado, over to you, uh, Birgit, uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonardo. And I must say I'm equally excited to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about one specific tool and one specific field of application when it comes to the overall topic that uh, Leonardo, you gave me for 10 minutes to, uh, to provide an overview of challenges, tools and applications when it comes to the challenge of understanding complex systems. So I will focus on a fairly high level on one of these tools on system dynamics. I will show in passing uh, a small example, but my good friend and colleague, Khaled Goffar, will go into much more detail and, uh, as I understand, actually show a model, something that I don't have a chance to do. So let's jump right into it. What is system dynamics? Uh, that's the next slide. So um, system dynamics has the word system in it, and it makes a lot of people think that, oh yeah, that's systems thinking. System dynamics emerges out of server mechanism engineering. So it doesn't emerge from general systems theory or cybernetics. It's a computer aided approach for strategy and policy design, and it complements systems thinking, but it really is based on feedback systems theory. Uh, the main goal of system dynamics is to help people make better decisions when confronted with, and now I'm coming to key, two key terms, complex systems and dynamic systems. Dynamic, that sounds intuitive or trivial, but isn't always dynamic systems or systems where key uh, performance indicators develop over time, unfold over time. So we don't look at a particular value of an indicator or of a metric. We look at its development over time and whether it's going in the right or in the wrong direction. And complexity, and the, oh, no, not yet. That's way too much. Complexity that's illustrated by the five uh, dark red uh, icons on the lower uh, left hand side of the slide. Complexity in system dynamics terms refers to feedback loops, to feedback thinking, information feedback thinking, not so much material feedback, but information feedback thinking, to accumulation and delays, to computer simulation. Uh, and to what we call our mantra that structure drives behavior. The structure meaning the causal interrelationship between variables uh, and how these causal interrelationships generate behavior over time. So we're interested in understanding the structure that generates an observed behavior so that we can then test out different policies uh, to alleviate problematic behavior or to move towards more desirable behavior. It's a very generic tool and methodology. It's applicable to anything that develops over time and that is characterized by information feedback. Uh, it can be ecological systems, uh, but also uh, other social, economic and uh, environmental systems. I personally have worked a lot on food security, uh, climate change, 
and larger sustainability and resilience uh, issues. And I would like to give you a very tiny little glimpse into uh, the into an application of the approach to study, and now we can move to the next slide, to study the issue of food security and resilience of food security to climate change and more specifically to, um, to droughts. So what I'm showing here, and we can already move to the, to the next slide, is an example where we built in a process that we call group model building. So in a process that involved a variety of stakeholders from small scale farmers to NGOs, uh, academic experts and government representatives on different levels, where we built together a, a fairly aggregated simulation model that looked at the resilience of food security and specifically food affordability, food consumption to droughts in the country of Guatemala. Now, I'm not expecting you to understand what's going on here uh, on what I think is a very intuitive map, what you probably think is more of a spaghetti diagram. But what this so-called uh, causal loop diagram does is it represents at a fairly high level the causal interrelationships, and here I get back to this issue of structure and information feedback thinking. So it re represents the causal interrelationships between key performance indicators and or processes. And on the upper left hand uh, side, we see processes related to um, to the maize market or to uh, to grain markets where we see reserves and consumption. On the lower left-hand side, we see the household sector, where farming households make decisions on how to generate cash and how to allocate cash. And on the right-hand side of the diagram, we see the, the natural system, where uh, natural resources such as water and soil interact to generate uh, yield. And where the arrow comes in, and uh, which represents droughts, that affects the water that is available for agriculture. So we have all the elements of the approach represented in this figure here. We have feedback thinking uh, th structure. Uh, we can feed this diagram with data and equations so that we can use it for modeling and simulation purposes. And we can then apply this model for uh, policy design. And policy design here, again, at a very highly aggregated level is represented by these four green uh, intervention points uh, that represent different types of interventions that are conceivable to increase the resilience of food availability to droughts. And you see that they range from infrastructure related interventions like irrigation, to more short-term uh, oriented policies like fertilizer and, uh, and other issues. Now, we then magically uh, feed this with data and we can move on to the, uh, to the next slide that again, at a fairly aggregated level represents a series of uh, simulation tests that we performed with this model. So we, what we did with, with this model was we calibrated it with data, we put in the equations, ran the model, and then performed a gazillion of Monte Carlo simulations to find two tipping points in the system. The first tipping point here is, or we see, and we see these three different stability regimes represented by the dark gray, the, the dashed, and the somewhat undefined black, white, light gray uh, bars that represent different reactions of the system to a drought. The dark gray uh, bar, bar for these two case study regions shows the stability domain, and it represents how much of a disturbance in terms of percentage reduction of rainfall the system can tolerate without deviating from the reference food availability, that is food availability in a situation without drought. Then we move to the so-called adaptation window where we see a deviation in food availability as a, as a reaction to drought, but it manages to bounce back. 
And then the undefined gray, whitish area, that's when the system transforms and never manages to, uh, to bend back after, after a drought. We see that for a baseline simulation, and then we see how these different policies that I had mentioned manage or fail to uh, fail to achieve an, an enlargement of these uh, windows of opportunities. So that's that's at a very high level what these types of models can do: address stability domains, uh, investigate tipping points. And if we move move to the next slide. What is intriguing is that um, the models that we use in system dynamics are fairly compact. So they're compact enough to run instantly on a laptop computer. They permit a whole series of alternative assumptions and scenarios to be tested pretty much in real time. And that offers up so many possibilities. It offers the possibility to do this live with stakeholders, which is represented on the left-hand side of the graph. So we can do that in boardrooms and immediately project, project the reactions of the computer simulation model to changes in input on the screen. We can also do it on the ground with uh, what I call fake simulation. That's one of the possibilities of, uh, that, uh, that arise from this uh, fairly instant uh, way of simulating results. The other possibility is that we put our models up on the web as interactive simulators and make them available for, for users to play with uh, different assumptions and different scenarios. And let me end with one final slide to, um, to, to, look, to go a bit, a bit broader. So what is the approach? I mean, it's wonderful, right? You can use it with stakeholders, you can put it on the web, but it's not, it's not your panacea for everything and anything. The approach is really best suited to, the, to questions such as, you know, will an operation or a company, will it, will it continue to expand or when and how will it reach its capacities and spiral into declines? Can, how can we, how can we dampen oscillations in, uh, company uh, sectors or company operations? Why do we not see the desired effect of policies, although we had all the good intentions? Why, 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 do, uh, why do systems become more rigid rather than more effective? And how long will it take in the system for these interventions to produce an effect or a benefit, or will we have to expect much longer delays? And that's all I have to say. That was my sales pitch for System Dynamics. Back to you, Leonardo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Birgit. And I know, you know, I was asking a lot actually to summarize, you know, <laughs> the entire field in uh, in ten minutes. But I, I think, you know, uh, participants actually uh, get the the idea and sort of the the high level um, uh, picture. So let me then for the next presentation move. Uh, to a discussion on how complexity uh, is integrated in policies and programs around disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management. So I'm very excited to have um, Adam Fish from UNDRR, that's the UN Office for uh, Disaster Risk Reduction, which will tell us about really how, uh, you know, this way of thinking in terms of systems and the complexity of the uh, of the systems that we uh, are uh, describing here and that we're talking about is shaping you know UNDRR's you know view of risk. Uh, Adam has worked in some of the main organizations dealing with humanitarian crisis you know WFP, UNICEF, IFRC and I'm sure he will discuss many aspects that will be many familiar uh, very familiar to many of the people working uh, close to uh, humanitarian operations in the humanitarian sector. So over to you, um, Adam, thank you. Thanks, Leonardo. I, I do hope that I can live up to that grand introduction. And I do hope that I will uh, hopefully hold my own in between two very, very interesting presentations. I, I've already taken down a number of notes from Dr. Kopinski's uh, sales pitch that I intend to capitalize on myself. 
Um, yeah, I'm Adam Fish from UNDRR, and UNDRR has been going through a bit of a shift in how we talk about and think about risk as, as well. Uh, since the Global Assessment Report 2019, we started talking about risk as being systemic. And this is not necessarily to say uh, systems risk or systemic risk, but really as different from other kinds of risk, it's that risk itself is systemic. Um, probabilities are always full of degrees of freedom that we can try to hermetically seal off in laboratory conditions to control them. But disasters and risk in the real world, as we all have seen, are super hyper-connected sets of drivers that can't be treated the way we have maybe traditionally done. Uh, a non-systemic risk might be a flip of a coin by a fair coin by a robot in a vacuum. Um, but that's not how disaster risk plays out. There are so, so many degrees of freedom. Um, and the challenges with prediction of disaster risk is that it's a problem of both poorly defined outcomes and poorly defined likelihoods. This makes probability-based analysis irrelevant except for a very narrow band of the drivers of risk. Uh, the probabilities or the likelihoods of something like COVID or the Beirut port explosion or the fires in Australia last year are infinite, infinitesimally small, right? These, I mean, nobody, nobody had this stuff in their models. But the emergence of other similarly damaging events now must not surprise us at all. And, and who knows what could happen tomorrow? Uh, and that's because we're getting these compound, multi-interconnected drivers of risk. Risk is complex, and humanitarian actors know it and have seen it in the cascading impact of disasters. Next slide, please. So to better understand the true nature of risk, there are a few important things that need that need to be present that we need not to take for granted. And the first one, if you have seen me in any panels or webinars before, is a bit my hobby horse. Risk is caused by more than just hazards. It's not flood risk or drought risk or storm risk any more than it is people built their homes in a river basin risk or regulations failed to keep people safe risk. When we let the focus stay on the hazards, we're making disasters something that happens to us. When we allow that disasters are also the product of millions of human decisions that create risk and sometimes create resilience, then we're being more fair and we're allowing that there are things that we could do something about it, over which we have some agency and some control. The other thing is that like risk, disasters are also systemic. An earthquake, uh, for those, uh, I guess a lot of you are in humanitarian organizations, an earthquake like the one that happened in Haiti 10 years ago, or anywhere, causes buildings to fall down. But the response to an earthquake isn't just about putting buildings back up again. People are made homeless, build it, businesses disrupted, schools become temporary shelters, which compromises education, fires break out from downed electrical facilities, transportation access is disrupted, local prices go crazy, water treatment is undermined, disease spreads. An earthquake isn't just an earthquake, and any more than risk is just the hazard. So this slide is one from our GAR 2019 and it gives some ideas about increasing stress. The items in the top tier are the everyday events, population growth and income inequality. But as the stress compounds on those things and other, other connections start to drive those things, you get once a year kinds of events in the second tier, droughts or loss of biodiversity, and that builds up and the compound effects takes their toll. And then you get once a decade events like crop failures and water conflict. And the unfunny punchline is that with enough compounding stressors like these, the prospect of global food production disruptions or COVID become really real and increasingly real uh, possibilities. And the probabilities of these tip overs are increasingly, increasingly increasing <laughs> and very little ca can be done to sort of undo it. Uh, or it seems that way if we keep the focus on hazards. Next, please. So one of the things is that data helps, of course. Data and evidence collection is necessary. Modeling is an absolutely useful tool and an essential tool. And by connecting those points of light around hazards and around exposure and around vulnerability and the structural factors and the trends and the impact, we start to make it possible to understand the bigger picture. But importantly, not with perfect clarity. It's not, you know, your, your eyes can only focus on one part at a time, even if you're looking at the whole cityscape. So to use this cliche that, you know, where the science of cartography becomes so exact that only a map of the same scale as the terrain will suffice, this is impractical. 
When we have more and more information to use, though, we can understand how drivers are connected and where there are opportunities to short circuit those tipping connectors of risk. As you will hear today, though, models are increasingly being used in humanitarian planning to understand how factors like drought, agriculture, migration combine to drive new cases of humanitarian need. Models are helping to anticipate the numbers or the type of people or the type of needs that are going to be created by different disaster events. Um, and this is, this is exciting. This is really a great place for us to be going. Next, please. So if we can't map and project probabilities associated with every driver of every risk in the world, and risk is systemic, and we can't realistically, then what's left? The answer is that we need to go deep. We have to use data and evidence to understand drivers of specific risks in specific contexts as richly as we can, understanding that we're never going to get it perfectly. So if you ask a question instead of, you know, what, when's the next COVID going to happen? But instead, if you said, why are there so many crop failures in northeastern Benin? Well, then you can, you can start to look at what drives that. You can look at agricultural subsidies and farmer knowledge and soil quality and water availability and pests and market access and crop suitability, traditional practices. There are lots and lots of ways that you can dig ever deeper to really understand what's going on and why is this a risk? Why is this a problem? What can we do to make it not a recurring case of humanitarian response, but rather something that can be intervened early uh, and hopefully avoided avoiding that sort of good money after bad problem. It's a really rich vein of information rather than consulting another flood map of Benin and trying to figure out why it doesn't help to, to understand what the risk is. And I think we're going to see a really interesting presentation. I have some familiarity with the presentation that's coming next, uh, and I'm excited to see it. One example of the work that we are doing in UNDRR to better understand and help manage systemic risk is what's called the GRAPH initiative. That's the next slide, please. Um, and this work is to help countries to access better for risk information, because without that, it's just garbage in, garbage out. They're using the same resources to get the same results. Uh, and then to work with experts in the countries in their own context to define the topics for their own custom systemic risk analysis around the questions of relevance in their context, linked to their priorities and their capacities. And that's what I mean by going deep. We're not trying to solve sort of all flood risk in a country, but really try to understand it in its specific context and what can be done to short circuit those tipping points and, and causing cycle after cycle of, of response requirement. And all of this idea is that we're trying to back it up with capacity building and support and advocacy to support, make, make the results get used. The point here isn't about developing a perfect model, but combining better information and more information and better processes to understand and apply data that does exist. And we're trying to work in the coming year or two in Fiji, Sudan, Bangladesh, Sudan, Somalia, uh, and hopefully a few others. So we'll hopefully have a chance to interact with some OCHA colleagues in some of those processes. You can see in the slide that there's a sort of a series of intervention points that we're trying to make possible that, you know, assuming that act is a problem, then we'll, we'll work on access. And assuming that analysis is a problem, we'll work on access and analysis, and then capacity, and then the incentives and resources to make the answers, the, the, the solutions happen. Uh, and lastly, we can save lives through risk reduction if we apply existing risk information better to inform more elements of risk, not just hazard mapping, but also to influence things like building codes or land use planning and enforcement of risk-informed standards. Better data combined with good systems for application and existing priorities and capacities can help sectors and communities understand what drives risk in their context and find better options to reduce it. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Adam. I know time is limited, but before going to the next presentation, can I ask you and Birgit to make it just say a couple of words on one question that we uh, have on the chat from Niels, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. So the question is, given the complexity of dynamic models, uh, how responsive the model is to stakeholder feedback? 
both when is the structure of the system that is changing or the behavior of the actors in the system that is changing. If you can just make a, a quick comment and then if we have time, we can go back to the discussion at the end. Uh, thank you. Adam, you want to go first? I think probably you are better suited to this one. I'm going to have another read through the question, make sure I understood it properly. <laughs> no, uh, well, thank you. That's a that's a great question. I would I would say it depends a lot on the on the specific modeling approach and on the specific platform with, within which the model is implemented. I mean, I pitched system dynamics in a very smart way in the sense that I, I pitched it as being super flexible. And it, in that sense, it is super flexible. The spaghetti diagram that I showed is, uh, is very open to being, to being modified and extended. And it doesn't require a lot of programming or, uh, uh, or t technological uh, woohoo to, to make this happen. I mean, every time you add a variable, you know, you you start breaking out into cold sweat because your model might uh, might just blow up and uh, do nothing like what it used to do before but it it's fairly it's fairly flexible to new data coming in and to new uh, relationships coming in that's a positive side the negative side is uh, I mean, we're always kind of just scratching on the surface when compared to models that have been built over to, over years and years, and that are uh, that are much more sophisticated and much more uh, detail rich. So it really depends on the model and on the problem. Thank you, thank you. And I think, Adam, do you want to add a couple of words, or we can't hear you? Feel. No. Yeah. Cool. Sorry. Uh, no, I think that this is becoming really the, the change in modeling. I'm not an expert in dynamic modeling. I, I defer to everyone else on the panel on this one. But I mean, we're seeing increasing uh, recognition, I guess, that the, there's sort of this this recognition that we're living in a in a VUCA world, right? To use the sort of uh, American military slang. This is we're in a volatile, uncertain, complex sort of dynamic world and, and being able to, I guess, work with resources, work with models that permit us to give away a little bit of the certainty associated with those LAMO, the uh, linear anthropocentric mechanistic and ordered approaches. Um, you know, we do give up some control. We do give up some certainty, but I, I think that the certainty that was associated with those is maybe a bit illusory. You know, we we're we are not operating in a in a vacuum. So a lot of the models do need to be able to be flexible, be adaptive, and uh, take in new new possibilities. Understanding, <laughs> I'm not the one who has to deal with it as a as a non modeler myself. Great, thank you. Yeah. So um, I see. Uh, so I invite everyone to post your questions. Um, I mean, we'll uh, we have limited time today, but we'll uh, reply uh, offline and make sure uh, that we follow up on your uh, questions. But really, feel free to use the Q and A uh, panel. So let's now move to um, a couple of concrete examples of how models can really have uh, uh, an impact. And, um, and it's, it's really a, a big pleasure to invite my former colleagues from the Norwegian Refugee Council's Internal Displacement Monitoring Center to present the work they have done on uh, uh, displacement and, and drought. Uh, we know that displacement crises are complex and we know that displacement usually comes from the accumulation of multiple stress factors really leading to a, a sort of a tipping point that pushes people to make uh, the, the decision to move elsewhere. And so that means that also the tools that we are, that we should be using to better understand displacement and to put in place, you know, successful policies uh, uh, must, you know, uh, be uh, adequate to the complexity of the, uh, of the system. So, um, I see Khaled, you're already sharing your screen. So over to um, Khaled Gafar and Maria Teresa Miranda Espinosa from uh, um, IDMC. Thank you. 
Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to start the presentation uh, by saying, well, first of all, introducing myself. I'm Maria Teresa Miranda. I'm the Information Management Coordinator at IDMC. And now we are going to present and we are going to talk about the work that IDMC has started a long time ago, since 2014, more or less, exploring the use of system dynamics to understand how drought uh, can trigger internal displacement. So, as Leonardo uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, drought is a very complex hazard that is very difficult to understand and to monitor because uh, first of all, it's very difficult to understand, identify when it starts, when it ends. And because of drought is a hazard that depends on a phenomenon that depends a lot on different demographic, socioeconomic and environmental conditions. Um, so I, in IDMC, uh, we wanted to explore more um, how can we understand what are the drivers, the triggers of internal displacement associated with drought, uh, given this complexity. So that's why we have started to explore uh, this uh, complex system in itself, uh, these complex interactions using um, system dynamics. And now my uh, colleague uh, Khaled is going to present and introduce why do we did the exercise, where do we focus, and how do we did it. Over to you, Khaled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa, and thank you for uh, everyone for the amazing presentations leading up to this one. So I will start by giving some context on uh, our drought displacement project. So we focused on a specific livelihood uh, in Somalia uh, called the pastoral livelihood. And basically pastoralists are people who rely primarily on livestock uh, as their main source of income and livelihood. Now to give some context on how important the livestock sector is to the Somalia uh, economy, um, around 65% of the Somalia population are engaged in the livestock economy directly or indirectly. It is the largest sector of the economy, around 40% of GDP. And around 50% of that, at least 50% of, um, of total livestock population in Somalia are raised within the pastoral economy. There are 2.6 million pastoralists as of 2014 in Somalia which is around one fifth of the Somalia total population uh, and uh, a little less than a half of the rural population of Somalia. Now to zoom in on drought, in the past five years, since 2016, there has been 1.6 million uh, total drought displacements, both in urban, rural, pastoral and non-pastoral areas. And it is expected as of April this year, that 380,000 individuals may be displaced by the end of the year 2021. So drought, uh, drought induced displacement is a recurring problem, as you can see in the past five years, 1.6 million displacements. It's a salient problem and it has dramatic or drastic uh, impacts on both the economy and society. So why use system dynamics? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward problem. A drought happens and it causes displacement. But to build on what uh, Adam said a few minutes ago, you know, having a risk uh, or um, a risk is not only caused by hazards. And this is the way we look at drought induced displacement at IDMC. So we believe that drought displacement is a complex phenomenon that is generated as a product of the interaction between environmental, social and economic systems. So instead of the simplistic cause and effect relationship you see here on the right side of the screen, it is more like this. So if I, if I may tell you very briefly the story that, uh, that our uh, model aims to tell. So you have rainfall causing uh, pastures to grow. The more rainfall you have, the more pastures you would have. And since pastoral populations rely primarily on grazing, grazing land, more pastures means more livestock, uh, or it means that livestock can grow and breed and prosper. The more livestock you have, the more pastoralists are able to practice their livelihood. So the better off pastoralists are. And the better off pastoralists are, the less, uh, the less uh, pastoralist displacement you can expect to see. So it's not a simple you know, hazard risk uh, cause and effect relationship. 
And if we aim to explain this complex phenomenon, we cannot simply look at either the economic systems in isolation or the environmental aspect in isolation. We need a holistic approach to be able to explain uh, drought-induced displacement, especially slow onset drought-induced displacement in terms of its key driving factors. So the goals of our, or this iteration, uh, it says the goal of the project, but as Maria Teresa kindly noted, this is the second iteration of working with the pastoralist uh, displacement model. So our first goal was to collect data that has become available in the past couple of years in order to establish a baseline for uh, pre the 2016-17 drought, which was uh, the most recent uh, large scale drought uh, experienced in Somalia. So we wanted to collect data to establish the baseline and then explain the pastoralist uh, drought displacement that occurred in the past couple of years uh, using the livelihood approach. So our model aims to uh, simulate uh, or represent the uh, pastoral livelihood, including their coping strategies to drought, uh, to try to see what are the, uh, as Professor uh, Kopensky said, if there are any tipping points uh, that cause, uh, um, that are closely related to displacement. And finally, uh, our last goal was to use the model that manages to explain uh, drought displacement to make future projections both of drought, so uh, generating drought scenarios for the future, as well as make projections on uh, displacement that would be caused as a result of these uh, drought scenarios. Okay, so model scope. I'm not going to go into the spaghetti of, of things, uh, but uh, to, be, uh, to give a very high level uh, picture of our model. Um, so we have an explanatory model that emphasizes on causal relationships, as Professor Kofiansky pointed out. And we basically feed the model with the baseline livelihood that we uh, established from our data collection, um, as well as the coping strategies uh, of pastoralists in response to drought. And finally, feed our model with possible future drought scenarios. And the model is able to give us displacement projections, of course, drought related displacement projections from the pastoral uh, livelihood, livelihood uh, zones. Nutrition projections, so the average uh, caloric intake per capita per day. This is also um, generated by the model. And the model enables us to do causal tracing to understand why uh, do these uh, uh, displacement and nutrition projections, uh, or why are they the way they are, uh, to explain the results that the model generates. Because the whole uh, point of system dynamics is to link, uh, link behavior to the structure that causes it. So this is. This is part of that effort. And finally, we want to use the model as a, as a flight simulator whereby uh, users of our model can uh, experiment with different what if scenarios uh, and different policies to try to mitigate the effects of drought on displacement. Okay, so in terms of the data that we used, we uh, experimented with data from multiple sources. Let me first start with the databases. So we uh, got data from economic databases, humanitarian, environmental. I can give examples, but I don't think it will be um, uh, the best um, uh, option in, because we're a bit short on time. Um, but this is again, if I may use this as an opportunity to highlight the or reiterate the flexibility of system dynamics uh, as a tool to synthesize multi-sectoral data and even models. So we have incorporated system dynamics models or structure from system dynamics models with models from all sorts of disciplinary literature. And uh, speaking of literature, we have also synthesized uh, data from uh, official reports, books, academic papers, workshops, and as I said, models. Now to give you a, a feel of the output of our um, modeling effort. So this is a graph over time of drought internally displaced persons. As you can see, it is disaggregated by different livelihood zones. And uh, basically anything that's below or anything that's before this yellow line is historical. And anything that comes after is projected. 
And the user, if a user was uh, was interested in using our model as a flight simulator, would be able, I'm not sure if you can see the font, I think the font is a bit small, but basically these are drought controls or variables that the user can uh, um, uh, change or tune, tweak. Uh, one of them is the frequency of drought, the duration of the drought, and the magnitude of the drought uh, percent lower than average. And, uh, you know, I, I must say that we took this straight out of uh, Professor Kopensky's uh, paper, uh, the one that she was uh, referring to in her own uh, presentation. So basically, these are all measures that the uh, user can uh, change or play around with. And in real time, the user will be able to see their impacts on the projections for drought induced displacement. And of course, the user can also experiment with policy sliders that will uh, enable them to observe the impacts of these policies in real time as well. Okay, so the next step, again, to, to sum up, we perceive our uh, project as yet another iteration in uh, understanding, explaining, and estimating the uh, impacts of pastoralist drought displacement. And uh, we hope to use it uh, with our partners and our um, uh, field experts to test and to assess different policies uh, to try to mitigate the impacts of displacement. And on that note, I would like to yield the floor back to my colleague Maria Teresa for concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. So basically what we have showed to, to you today is like how the modeler applies the, the problem or tries to resolve the problem that we had. And now um, we are going to close the presentation talking about what we can do with this uh, knowledge and information or the model. So basically what- uh, Thank you, Maria Teresa, if you can just maybe wrap up quickly just because we're running out of time, thank you. Okay, uh, if you can click over uh, Khaled so we can see. Yeah, so basically what uh, with the model, the model uh, help us to understand and to learn a lot, to identify uh, gaps of information and also to try to explore how a different policies could have an impact on future scenarios of uh, displacement. So basically, for me, one of the most important things to say to close is that using system dynamics help us to have a bottom up approach to build a model and to, to go from the expert in the field like the, the organizations that we work with in Somalia to the model, to the modeler, and then go back to them in order to iterate the process and improve the model and the potential results. So I would like to close with that and thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Maria Teresa. Thank you, Kale. That's really, uh, really exciting. And I see many people really, uh, asking questions and you know uh, there's a lot of interest so uh, we're running short of on time so we'll do uh, the q a offline but really the goal of today is really to establish this connection between the models and the uh, uh, the actual problem owners so that that's really uh, an exchange that we would like to see so in this sense this is really just the beginning um, I would like to move uh, to um, um, Asjad Nakfi to provide us with a different example. So Asjad is assistant professor at the uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business and also a research scholar at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna. And what I find really interesting of uh, you know, his work is you know, looking at how climate shocks um, cause disruption both on the supply side and the production, but also on the demand side. But most importantly, how, you know, the, the, the risk is a cascading risk so that even regions or areas that are not affected by a crisis can be uh, impacted by a nearby uh, event. And, uh, you know, uh, ASJAD will also provide practical examples on uh, uh, specific events. So over to you, uh, Asjad, and I'm um, asking you to, to kindly stick to the, uh, uh, to the time um, that we have for this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Leonardo, for inviting me to this event. Um, so this is a topic I've been working on for the past 12, 13 years, and it's something I've been moving in and out of over the last decade or so. 
So, um, so this presentation, no, for, stay on the opening slide, please. Yeah, so this presentation aims to look at how climate shocks cascade and the way I want to frame it is that we need to rethink economic systems as multi layers. And these layers can then be endowed with agent based rules and then we can see how these layers interact with each other. So next slide please. So this is something everybody is aware of. A shock happens, you know, so you are observing some trends. So there are some market functioning happening before the shock and this red line the shock happens. Then there is chaos, people are getting displaced, markets are fluctuating, a lot of stuff is happening, displacement is happening. And so what's happening in this transition phase is all these nonlinear interactions are, are moving you towards what's sort of a new equilibrium. Yeah, and so these post shock scenarios, you can end up in a host of different situations, which could be better than the pre baseline scenario, equal to the baseline scenario, or worse than the baseline scenario. Yeah, so you read this a lot in this climate literature about building right better. Some countries manage to do it, some just constantly end up in a low income poverty trap. And so, really, the issue here is that if you are in a, in a poor region setting, what you really need is sort of a very fast response with very limited resources. And so your decision time is extremely limited. And that's why these sort of system dynamic models or agent based models can play a role because if you are aware of the situation on the ground, you know sort of what the behavior would be like. Yeah, so this is, I'm not talking about somebody flying in and say, oh, use this model, but really a bottom, on the ground model, which people can sort of apply. And so if you work with on any of these developing countries, you know that the data is poor. So if you have a data which is poor and you don't know what's in the baseline, there is no, there's little you can do with the end line because there is no comparison as such. You know, you can get some indicators on, you know, okay, we know poverty exists and farming is the primary income source. And so simulations can sort of help map out these broad post shock outcomes. Um, so next slide, please. And so here, what I would like you to, to think about is to think of economic systems as network structure. You know, usually when we're talking about network models, we usually take this extremely top-down view where we just see this bunch of nodes interacting with each other. But underlying these top-down structures are more complex interconnected network structures. And so here is one example where I'm talking about, let's say, let's break down villages into production layers and uh, household layers, yeah? So the production layer is producing output, it could be crops, it could be services, other things. The household layer is providing labor supply, it has a working age population, they're earning income. So within a node or within a cluster of nodes, there's a lot of interaction, economic interaction happening within each other, which sort of forms like this, localized economic cluster. But these nodes are not just isolated. They are also interacting with each other. So for example, just at the production layer, when you're producing crops, you might use some for your own consumption, which is subsistence farming. You might sell some to nearby markets, for example. So for example, in households, you might have somebody working on the farm, but you know, two kids from the family might be working in a nearby village or other farms or even in cities. And so what you have are these production layers that are sort of have their own structures that evolve with each other. And each location might be super, super relevant in one network structure, but not, might not be so in another structure. And that's why it's important to sort of break down these network layers because these kind of banal things then end up what's called systemic risk because sort of benign nodes might exacerbate the whole situation, causing the whole system to fluctuate even more. And so what we want to do with this structure is to break down systems into different layers and understand these layers, how they function. And so what we want to do is see how shocks to one part of this multi-layer network structure can cascade through the remaining system. And here I would also like to highlight Another thing that I've worked on a lot in the last few years is the role of thresholds. So thresholds are, if you are hit by a shock, how do you cope? You cope by running down your savings, you sell your livelihoods, you borrow money, or you migrate, 
or displaced. Yeah. And so these thresholds, if they affect a lot of people, then you suddenly have a very nonlinear, exploding, cascading thing happening across the whole system. Because let's say a factory gets destroyed, it was the sole employer, everybody has to eat. Yeah, or food is not available, or income is not available, or there's a capital collapse of capital stock. And so these thresholds play a role. So if you are a seller, you will not sell in a market where there is no demand or you're not earning anything. You might redirect somewhere else. And so because then these causes, these things also cause food shortages, for example. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so again, in a 10 minute, I'll just show you as much as I can show you. <laughs> so let's say you have a simulation network of my multi-layer networks and let's say you have food nodes and goods nodes and then you shop this gray part of these networks so these are let's say one of the thousands of networks one can generate so these are all the Monte Carlo simulations and so what we know a shock happens you destroy crops you know that as a result wages will go down food prices will go up and then food insecurity will increase so in the middle graph what you can see is the percentage change in food consumption based on the level of the shock yeah this is nothing exciting or everybody knows that that this happens but let's say if you look at the graph on the right hand side which shows you the distance from the shock line and how connected you are what you see are these patterns emerge over time in the sense that you can see the shock spreading over time because as supply networks are evolving and displacement networks are evolving and wages are fluctuating and prices are fluctuating and some market forces are coming, playing a role in how to balance these things out. And what you see here is that basically the system, the shock can spread to the end of the whole, whatever network structure, and can in some cases even bounce back because once you hit the system boundaries, there might be more ripple effects. What you can also observe in this network structure is that nodes that are highly connected get the risk very early on, but pass it on immediately because they have the network structures to sort of be more adaptive, let's say, as opposed to a single village in a remote mountain, which only has one road going to it. So these are sort of the kind of experimental things one can ex extract from these simulations. Uh, next slide, please. So once you have these very complex- Yeah, thank you. Uh, Asjad, if you can quickly uh, go through the, the other two slides you have. Yeah, I will just finish again, this. Sorry. So, here the aim is to sort of quantify these multi-layer risks, so what we call a vulnerability index. So rather than having all these complex interactions, you can summarize this uh, using a single measure. Uh, so it comes from system systemic risk literature in finance. Then again, from this work, we can also look at these vulnerability cycles. So what you have is this cyclical pattern of vulnerability where you see the starting point and the ending point, but what you don't see is the adjustment process. So these simulations can help you explain what sort of the midline transition phase vulnerabilities that can involve in this process. Um, so the next slide, please. And so a lot of this has been applied. So it was applied to the 2010 Pakistan floods, the 2005 Kashmir earthquake, the 2003 droughts in India. So a lot of over time, a lot of new stuff has been built into this, including market search algorithms, spatial integrations, copular risk structures. Um, so this is being expanded now to more is um, being zoomed out. So for example, you can have very different layer types. So what we are now looking at is cascading value chain risks, balance sheet risks, balance of payment risks. Here we are working with ADP and uh, with the government of Fiji also to look at how does one rebuild, how disaster financing should work, should it be demand side or supply side recovery. So that's it, very quick presentation from my end. Thank you, thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, Asjad. So I see, I see we still have, you know, uh, more than 140 people in the room. So we plan just to go a few minutes, like five, 10 max minutes, um, um, and then to wrap up. So, because I see many, many questions. So, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, many of these will be answered uh, uh, offline and, you know, but we really wanted to have this as sort of a, a, an exchange between, uh, as an opportunity to have this discussion and to really start this discussion. So, as you have seen, we, we have learned a lot from, uh, you know, different 
perspective. So, and that's really the, the opportunity that we see at the center. And that's why we organized this, uh, 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 this webinar uh, today. And that's really the big question that we are tackling now uh, at the center. So how do we develop an impactful model? So impactful, so we're interested in what is the output of the model, but also what is the process of developing an impactful model that, you know, we want also want to make sure that we build models that are adopted and are actually informing uh, 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 an action. So we are uh, we have been engaging both with modelers and with humanitarians, and I'm glad to have Roberta Rocca today. Uh, that is our predictive analytics uh, data fellow uh, this year. And this is exactly the, the question that she uh, is uh, exploring. So what is the right use case? What are the big questions in the humanitarian uh, uh, space that can be answered with a system dynamics, with a complex system uh, modeling uh, approach? So I invite Roberta to uh, share uh, some reflections actually based on the discussions that we had both with technical partners, with humanitarians, and then I think we can uh, uh, wrap up the, uh, the webinar. Thank you very much. Roberta, over to you. Thank you, Leonardo, and thank you all for being here today. It's a pleasure to, to speak uh, in this context. So as Leonardo mentioned, I'm the uh, Predictive Analytics Fellow at the Center for, the, for Humanitarian Data this year. And I'm mostly focusing on exploring the possibility to introduce complex system modeling techniques to um, complement uh, current humanitarian needs assessment methods. Um, as you've heard in the many excellent uh, contributions to, the, to this event, uh, complex system modeling can really be a game changer for the humanitarian sector. Uh, many humanitarian crises, and especially the most uh, resilient ones, the hardest to tackle, uh, come about and unfold as a function of complex dependencies between different factors. Um, and these factors tend to span different domains, so from environmental factors to social and political ones. So introducing modeling techniques that actually factor in this complexity is not only an opportunity to reach um, a shared, deeper understanding of how these crises unfold, but it's also a very concrete opportunity to give humanitarians uh, concrete tools to navigate and maybe understand such complexity, but above all, to actually intervene on it. So, um, yeah, the dynamic modeling techniques and, uh, as you've heard, uh, some of the presenter presenters introduce, all the simulation interfaces that can be developed starting from these models can really help us uh, project and visualize possible future scenarios in ways that current techniques only affords in very indirect way. And if we can actually do that, we can also possibly identify some leverage points to intervene on the system and help people in need, which is really sort of ultimately the goal of uh, humanitarian action. Um, this is the general frame, framework that uh, underlies the fellowship project I'm carrying out at the center. And in the next slides, there's some concrete, uh, some more concrete details about uh, what we're doing. Um, so in order to turn this framework into um, sort of concrete opportunities for improving humanitarian response, we are currently uh, interviewing a number of uh, both technical experts and humanitarian actors. Uh, we're talking to technical experts to identify potential partners for the technical side of model development, but at the same time, we're interviewing humanitarian actors to help us identify where the demand really is from the point of view of field staff. Uh, and that means how exactly should we and can we uh, complement current uh, needs assessment methods to better support um, data informed response planning, especially in the context of uh, complex crises. And all in all, so far, the response, both from technical experts and field staff, has been very, very positive. There seems to be especially a strong demand for tools that sort of by design support the possibility of visualizing the structure of the complex problems we're dealing with and to also project future scenarios, uh, the what ifs Khaled was referring to in intuitive ways. And that's really what we need to help humanitarians prepare a response um, according to these projections. Um, currently, we're really in the process of narrowing down our focus to one or a few concrete problem spaces to start a pilot over the coming months. And 
what we're trying to do and what we're especially keen on doing is to think about a paradigm to develop these models, which is intrinsically collaborative. So we're like, it's not the modeler doing the whole work, but, uh, and then sort of pushing a model to the field. Uh, we're still in the previous slide. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so, um, it's not where like a scenario where the modeler does the whole work, but, uh, it's a sort of a development paradigm where clients and stakeholders are constantly involved in uh, defining and validating the structure of the model. Um, the outcomes of the project will be uh, available in our final report, but also we'll have a like a public showcase at the end of the fellowship, and that's going to be at the end of July, uh, where everyone is welcome to join. Um, the details have not been announced yet, but they will soon be. So if you keep an eye on the center's Twitter feed, uh, you'll probably find that, and you're very welcome to join. Um, in terms of what we're planning to do or where this is going in the medium the medium term. Um, if these efforts to pilot model develop, like complex modeling techniques in the humanitarian sectors uh, are successful, the goal is really to work towards systematically embedding these methods in humanitarian respo response planning. And there are um, a number of like key success criteria that would ensure uh, sort of a successful outcome for this uh, for this attempt. One of them is really, and that emerges uh, emerged also in some of the previous presentations, is really the need to establish a synergy with field staff and stakeholders and domain experts, because that's really how the model emerges and how we can develop tools that are reliable and useful. Uh, but in the long term, it's also crucial to partner with the development sector, where the use of system dynamics methods, for example, is already very common. Um, and where that would sort of, sort of also allow us to focus on problems where we need to look at long term uh, solutions. But a key part of this is also involvement uh, from a larger community. And by larger community, I mean potentially everyone among you. So, uh, again, both on the technical side, but also in practical terms. So, if you have resources, data, expertise, or ideas that can help us do get in touch um, because every contribution can be a great asset for us. But also if you can think of specific problems or use cases that uh, could be, could particularly benefit from taking a complex system approach to it, do get in touch because really identifying useful problem spaces is really our main question at this stage. Um, and that's pretty much it on my side. Thank you for uh, your attention and I hope, uh, yeah, to hear from some of you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta, and good job. You managed to keep 130 people online over time. So that, that means that there's definitely interest on the uh, on the topic. So um, I think um, I think it's time to, to wrap up. So we were supposed to have a Q&A and a discussion, but as I said, I really see this webinar as the beginning of you know, new collaborations between modelers and humanitarians. And as I said, so we really want you to reach out and start you know, collaborating with, uh, uh, with, with the center and with, uh, you know, we, we can facilitate also the connections with the technical experts to really hope that we'll collectively be able to, to seize the opportunity that these models provide. Uh, another way that I want to mention, just because you know I'm lucky and I can speak to uh, many technical uh, people or people dealing with models, to engage with the center is with our peer review framework. So we want to use models, but we want to make sure that models are used in a responsible way, in an ethical way, and that's really the goal of our peer review framework. So, so you can either join our pool of reviewers if you have a specific expertise in a domain, uh, or you can submit your model for peer review and you have the link and we'll be sharing all the uh, information. So with this, um, we are 10 minutes late. Sorry for the delay, but there was actually a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, presentations and stuff to discuss. So um, I'm really, uh, so I would really, first of all, thank all the speakers for uh, uh, really sharing their uh, expertise, their uh, insights. Really, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I really hope you will hear from some of the end users uh, very soon and will be happy uh, to collaborate on this. Thank you uh, very much to all of you for uh, connecting uh, today. And so please sign up to the uh, mailing list uh, of the uh, of the center, and we very much look look forward to uh, hearing uh, from you.
in the meantime thank you very much for your participation and uh, see you soon thank you all